Hello everyone. In this video, we'll look at how you can take one of these simple, readily available Geiger counter boards, connect them to a Raspberry Pi, add a nice case, some more parts, and turn it into this. A full featured device with an animated display, visualizations, built-in web-based analytics, and of course, Home Assistant connectivity. Like most of my videos, this project is open source and you can download all of the code for free. In addition, I'll show you how I built this Pi-based replica of an old 1980s Digital Equipment Corp video terminal that you may have seen in the background of many of my videos. But first, let's start with the Geiger counter project. In case you're totally unfamiliar, Geiger counters detect and measure radiation, typically gamma rays, which are generated by nuclear explosions, lightning, and natural activity like radioactive decay. You can find these Geiger counter boards for about $50 online. They often call them a kit, but most are already assembled and include the actual radiation sensor, which is this glass Geiger Mueller tube. If the price seems too low, the kit may not include the tube, so confirm before you buy. So what do you actually get here? Well, you get a device that blinks and chirps faster and faster as more radioactivity is detected. As I bring this radioactive material closer to the detection tube, you can see what I mean. This material is just a part from an old camping lantern that happens to contain thorium, which is mildly radioactive. That's pretty much all this board does, though. No digital display, no microcontroller, and no serial data output. Very basic detection and not very exciting. However, this pin on the detector board marked V in provides a square wave output, basically a pulse that goes logic low whenever there's a radioactive detection or chirp. If we connect an oscilloscope to these pins, we can observe the primitive data waveform. Now, if we connect this pin to a Raspberry Pi instead, we can start counting these pulses and the real fun begins. Let's see how. Once the Pi is in place, we can see what counting those pulses can get us. On the main display, our code shows how many clicks have been counted in the last 60 seconds, known as clicks per minute or CPM. That's a standard measurement for radiation. Another measurement is below that, known as microsieverts per hour. To get this value, you need a special factor that is specific to your detection tube and apply it to the number of clicks. There's also this animation of four virtual LEDs so you can visually see the click activity. Along the bottom is a bar graph that shows the level of clicks over the last hour, with each bar representing the number of clicks in one minute. Pushing the display button changes the graph to show the last 48 hours, with each bar representing the number of clicks in one hour. Pushing the button again gives us information about the device, such as the IP address and software version. Another push, and we can see the alarm setting. If the radiation level exceeds this value, the unit will trip an internal relay. The relay is connected to this jack on the back and can switch any kind of external device, such as this LED tower. If I bring the thorium closer, you can see the alarm in action. One more button press and the radiation level is displayed using a Nixie tube visualization. Nixie tubes were displays that were popular from the 1950s through the 1970s before LED displays were widespread. You might be wondering why I didn't just use a microcontroller because everything I've shown you so far could be accomplished with one of these $5 Picos. But hang on. There's more features to show you, and we'll need the more powerful Pi 3 to do them. Every click is stored locally in an InfluxDB database, which lets us create some nice graphs of the measurement data. You can browse to the IP address of the device to see its graphing page, which is based on the Grafana data visualization tool. The top graph shows the full scale of radiation detection, while the bottom one displays finer grained measurements. You can change the date range of the graphs using this drop-down in case you missed a past radioactive event. Remember that all of the data you see on the display and in the graphs is derived simply from the constant pulses coming from the Geiger counter board. The Pi makes it happen, and that's pretty neat. 
It's also a great hardware and programming exercise. But how accurate is this device? That's up for debate, but without proper calibration, we really don't know. In addition, the dose rate, that's this value in microsieverts, is an incredibly rough estimation based on a calculation that is specific to this Geiger-Muller tube. It could be wildly wrong, potentially even orders of magnitude wrong, so it's great for getting relative differences in radiation levels, but should not be used for critical or life-threatening situations. This is for hobbyist use only. The device also publishes this data to other devices on the network using MQTT, a lightweight network protocol. For more about MQTT, check out my last two videos. Applications such as Home Assistant can subscribe to the data published by the Pi Geiger counter and display it in real time. Now I can view the readings from anywhere, even on my phone. I also programmed a button to turn the audible click on and off. An icon on the screen indicates the state of the speaker. To achieve this, I removed the small speaker from the Geiger board and then wired it through a relay that is controlled by the Pi. The full wiring diagram is available in the linked repo. To make this look more like a serious laboratory device, I found an enclosure online designed for holding test equipment. There are many styles and sizes to choose from, but this particular one is now difficult to source. I drilled some holes in the top and added clear plastic so you can see the electronics inside. The front and back panels that came with the case were discarded, and I designed new ones in Tinkercad with all the necessary holes for the switches and display. Then I simply 3D printed them. All of the internal boards are mounted to this grid using standoffs. Then the grid itself is affixed to the base. This is the power supply board that has a barrel connector for a 12 volt input on one end. The other end has a 5 volt, 5 amp output through a USB connector for the Pi and also through screw terminals for the Geiger board. Then it's just a matter of adding each board one by one until everything is bolted together and wired up. So here's the final build. Let's take a look at the main parts. The power supply input is accessed by a hole in the back of the unit. It sends power to the Raspberry Pi 3A Plus and the Geiger board. The Pi also controls the two relays, one for the speaker and the other for the alarm output. The buttons are wired into this small side-mounted PCB, which is connected to the Pi's header pins via jumper cables. Let's briefly look at the software running on the Pi that makes this device work. The code that reads the pulses from the Geiger board, the button presses, and drives the display is all written in Python. You may think Python is not fast enough to count the pulses and animate the screen simultaneously, but the Adafruit library that drives the LCD can be accelerated by installing the math package called NumPy. If you happen to use my repo, though, you don't have to worry about installing any packages because everything is containerized, so all the necessary software is automatically installed and configured for you. Containers are sort of like small virtual machines, and this device has five containers running on the Pi. You can use Docker on Pi OS to run these containers, or, as I'm showing here, Belena OS, which runs the containers on my Pi, but has this nice cloud-based dashboard for greater control. My Python code is running in the sensor container, while the click data is stored in the database in the InfluxDB container. The connector runs software to connect the database to the dashboard, which is running the Grafana visualization package. So that's the Geiger counter, a fun weekend or multi-evening project. Now let's spend a few minutes talking about this item that often sits in the background of my videos. It's called the Deck Mini, and I probably get more questions about this retro computing item than I do about anything else in my videos. So Deck stands for the Digital Equipment Corporation, a major computer company from the 1960s until it was sold to Compaq in 1998. It's now owned by HP. DEC was famous for their dumb terminals in the 1970s, such as the model VT100, which was designed to interact with the mini computers of the day. 
This is a slightly smaller replica of a VT101, but with a Raspberry Pi and an LCD inside, rather than an Intel 8080 and an old CRT like the original. The replica was designed by technologist Lorenzo Herrera, and all of the instructions, part list, and 3D printer files are available on his website. The DEC Mini requires 3D printing almost 20 pieces, some of them very large. Once you download the STL files from the GitHub repo, you'll need to slice them in your software of choice so your 3D printer can print them. I printed them in 2022 on my Creality Ender 3 V2, and they barely fit on the print bed. The largest piece alone took upwards of 40 hours to print. I would strongly recommend using a faster, more modern printer if you plan to try out this project. I mainly built this as a prop, so it does not stand up well to close inspection, but I'm willing to break the illusion for you, my audience. It consists of four main parts, and if you look closely, you can actually see the seams. I never bolted it completely together, so it's pretty easy to take apart. I have to give the designer a lot of credit because he did a great job, even though I kind of butchered the build a bit, as you can see. Looking inside, you'll see a power supply, the Raspberry Pi 4 itself, in this case a 4 gigabyte version. There's also dual 5-inch speakers connected to a small audio amplifier. All these parts are specified on the Deck Mini website. See the video description for a link. Now, as I awkwardly turn the front panel around, you can see the back of the 10-inch Pimeroni LCD, which just uses a standard HDMI connection. It's actually running Raspberry Pi OS with a desktop, but to make it look more vintage, I always show it running a program called Cool Retro Term, a terminal emulator which mimics the look and feel of the old cathode ray tube screens. It has a lot of settings to get just the right amount of distortion to make an LCD look like a CRT. That distortion includes blooming, burn-in, jitter, and even horizontal sync lines, all artifacts that you don't really see anymore, but that help this replica look legit. The Deck Mini has some features that were definitely not in the original, such as an optional floppy drive. Mine is still disconnected. There's also this RGB LED keyboard that provides a modern flair, though it does seem a bit out of place. It's usually not very visible in my videos. We can tie these two projects together by reading the Geiger value on the Deck Mini terminal using this tool called MQTTX. I'll subscribe to the topic, and as soon as the Geiger counter publishes some data, we'll see it. Finally, I wrote a simple Python program to scroll a bunch of old logs and some random text down the screen over and over to make it look like it's doing something really important. I considered buying an old CRT-based computer like the Commodore PET or a TRS-80, but the prices are pretty high these days and keeping them in working order can be challenging. For basically a prop, this replica works quite well. Now that the secret's out though, I'll be on the lookout for a new and interesting background device, so stay tuned. Anyway, that's all for now. Please hit that like button and also subscribe so you don't miss my next video. And thanks for watching.